and we keep trucking along like um this is my third pike's peak ascent and i'd like to do many many more here we go everyone in the studio pike's peak ascent recap breaking down what happened with a strava flyby and yes jumping right into it tip of the day oh this is amazing okay i know i've mentioned this in the past but you got to do it you just got to do it keep your bib numbers from your races whether it's a small local turkey trot or a big peak race like the pikes peak ascent for me in 2019 here is the 2019 bib number number 103 so what i do is i write the date the time that i ran and the place on every single bib number in every race that i've ever run and then i put it in a box a shoe box and just keep it safe well sure enough i went digging just a minute ago and i found it the 2017 bib number from the pikes peak ascent look at that august 19th 2017 third place two hours 21 minutes and 45 seconds 2019 two hours 12 minutes and 45 seconds so if i'm doing the math exactly to the second nine minute pr that's amazing so that's the tip of the day keep your bib numbers write your times down and anything even like sometimes i'll put location um and sometimes i do it on the back front anywhere just to get some information on your bib numbers so that's the tip and let's dive into it breaking down the pikes peak ascent in the solomon s lab sense 7 sgs by the way i'm gonna make an amendment to my running shoe reviews moving forward remember how i do let's just pick one real quick here the turbos remember how i do 50 miles in a running shoe before giving a full review well i'm realizing for racing shoes it takes a long time to get to 50 miles i don't even know if i'll get to 50 miles in this shoe so i'm probably gonna make it I might even do like two races instead of a distance. Uh, and now I have two races in this uh, Solomon S Lab Sense 7 SG. So I feel really confident in giving you a full review. That'll be happening very soon. But rather than go to 50 miles, it'll probably be two races is what I'm thinking moving forward. Okay, so Pikes Peak. This was basically my biggest race of the year until I had the in So I had the Cleveland Marathon for May. I, got, I had an injury, so I was unable to do it. And my second big race was Pikes Peak. But now, because of Amsterdam in October, that is, that is, that is, that, tr I will just say it, that supersedes the Pikes Peak Ascent because it's a really important race to, to really nail on race day in order to qualify for the Olympic trials in the marathon. So, but nonetheless, Pikes Peak was a big deal. And I believe that I did a pretty good job sticking to my race plan. And I'm not gonna break down, remember a couple days ago, I, I walked you through uh, my, my game plan for Pikes Peak and here it is on paper. I will keep this as well for the future just to reference back to. Uh, basically, I guess one thing is I was in second place immediately. I thought I would be top 10. I thought guys would actually go back, go out faster. I feel like in 2017, guys went out faster off the starting line. But anyway, I was immediately in second right behind Joe Gray. And I did mention here at mile 9.9 .9 or 10 miles, which is tree line, I said here, I expect one or two competitors around a tree line, ahead or behind uh, with a 5K to go. And sure enough, of course, Joe was, at that point, Joe was probably, he was probably at that point, I'm guessing about two to two and a half minutes ahead of me based on the uh, Strava flyby, uh, or sorry, not based on the, based on the cheering at the aid stations. And I will just mention how I know where Joe was ahead of me throughout the entire race. So the gun goes off. Uh, there's seven or eight aid stations. I think there's seven aid stations along the way. What you can do if you're like listening for competitors, you listen for people cheering and using cowbells ahead of you. And then you can look at your watch and then you can time. Okay, this is when, you know, your competitor went through the aid station. Boom. Now I'm at the aid station. Boom. My competitor is 52 seconds ahead or whatever the case may be. So that's how I knew that Joe, he was around 45 seconds and then a minute and a half. And then eventually at uh, the at tree line, it sounded like about two and a half minutes based on looking at my watch. And yes, I'm gonna put on screen right now, the Strava flyby, in case you didn't, if you've never seen this feature before on Strava, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's only on the des desktop version. So there's the start, there's my little dot. I'm in the lead there, The black. I think I'm a black circle going up the trail. And by the way, 
I guess Joe did not upload his race to Strava, so he is not in this flyby. Uh, so I'm in, I'm not in the lead, just so you know, Joe is ahead of me, but I love Strava flybys as you see me going up the mountain here at about halfway point right now, because it gives me a sense of what was actually happening in the race behind me. And I believe it was the green circle, I'm not sure, but his name was Galen Burrell. He ended up in third place, and it sounds like looking at the Strava flyby, he didn't take over third place until... It looks like about tree line, maybe even a little above tree line. So that's interesting. I had no clue, obviously, what was going on behind. And I think third place, it would. So uh, Joe was basically like three minutes, 45 seconds, or yeah, right around three minutes, 45 seconds ahead of me. And then third place was like 15 minutes behind me. So I was pretty much in no man's land, uh, a good chunk of the race, meaning nobody, no other competitors around me. Now, as far as my overall pace, you can see it here on your screen. It breaks down all the stats for the different aid stations. My overall mile pace was 9.58 a mile. I'm very happy with that, pleased with that. I was, I thought I could run about 10 minute pace. So I'm actually very pleased with 9.58. And then you can see Joe there, he was 9.41 a mile. So about 17 seconds per mile faster than I was. And uh, I just feel very uh, fortunate that I kept it that close. Like, listen, Obviously, I go to a starting line and I want to rock and roll and I'm going for the win. Like, I'm not going there to just get second place. So, you know, you just got to show up and, and battle every single race. And so that was, you know, that was my mindset on the starting line. Like, let's do this. I knew I had, you know, I knew in my gut, like Joe's probably going to take it out. And of course he did. But um, I kept it much, much closer than two years ago. In fact, I think uh, he was, I think Joe finished like 12 or 13 minutes faster than me two years ago. So obviously the gap closed a lot. And I do just want to point out one thing, and I'm making a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a stretch here, but listen to this, I'm pretty excited about this. So at Bar Camp, about halfway up the mountain, a little past halfway, uh, it's called Bar Camp, a big aid station. I, Joe came through and where was Joe? I think he was like 101 something, one hour and one minute. And then I was through in 103.07, so about two minutes back at bar camp. But Killian, who was racing the marathon, and this is where I'm stretching it a little bit, but Killian, basically, you know, I would say the best mountain runner in the world. He's done, he's, he's hiked Everest a couple times in one week. He's just insane. He came through bar camp in 103.49, so about 30 seconds slower than me. I realized he was racing a marathon, I was doing the ascent, so I get it. But it just gives me a sense of effort and like my perceived effort, what my pace feels like compared to Joe up ahead, to Killian slightly behind, even though he did double the distance that day. Uh, but here's where it gets interesting is that by the top, uh, Joe had put another like minute and a half, minute 45 on me. Um, so in the next five miles, Joe, you know, kept, kept cruising. I tried, uh, but he put more time on me and so did, but Killian put uh, over three minutes and 45 seconds on me from bar camp to the top, of course, fully realizing he was doing the marathon, but it just, again, as far as my perceived effort and actual effort, I shouldn't say perceived, but my actual effort, what it felt like, kind of the pain that I was in and comparing it to really, I'll just say like these other world-class mountain runners. And it gives me frankly quite a bit of hope for the future and trying to not only race in the United States, but hopping across the pond to go battle with the dudes over in the Alps uh, next summer, 2020. So anyway, it's pretty interesting. So Killian's, okay, so at the top, uh, Joe is at 208.59. Killian 209.12 and I was 212.45. So again, about four minutes back from Joe and a, well, yeah, Joe and Killian basically were uh, neck and neck at the top, Joe a little bit ahead. So fascinating, I'll take it again. I'm always going for the win when I show up at the starting line, but a nine minute PR is good. It's good and I'm not forgetting that I was in a boot and on a, a, a scooter, you know, two and a half months ago. So, um, you know, maybe it played to my benefit in the sense that I was, my legs maybe are a little more fresh. They're not quite as tired this summer, but at the same time, I did miss, you know, eight weeks of running in, uh, what was it? Was it May and June or late April? Uh, yeah, I guess April, May and a little, and well, 
gosh, how much did I miss everyone? Do you guys remember? I missed at least eight weeks of running. So I'm excited. So in conclusion, thank you to everyone who sent me clips. I can't even tell you brought tears to people. Uh, and I know you brought tears because they're saying it in the comments. Uh, people out there cheering, saying seek beauty, work hard and love each other. And then filming like those that went up the mountain and filmed and then sent me the clips that day. Like huge kudos to you because you brought a lot of joy to a lot of people around the world who would not have been able to experience the race without your help. So thank you for doing that. Like I can't even, uh, it's just incredible. And I don't even, I couldn't shake your hand after the race because you're down the mountain and I'm on top. Anyway, it was incredible. I'm very pleased and I think I'll be back. Does that sound good? I think I'll come back. Uh, if, if the body holds up and we keep trucking along, like um, this is my third Pikes Peak Ascent and I'd like to do many, many more. So I'm excited for the future. Uh, keyword, we're gonna go with flyby because Strava flyby, that's what that thing was on the screen moving across. And the question of the day, how do you reflect on your running races, especially the big ones where you really like, do you, how much time do you give yourself? I usually give a, at least a couple days just to process and then, uh, but I don't want it to go too long. So I, I it's fresh in my memory. But uh, how do you process and mull over and try and learn from your races? Okay, just give us a few maybe strategies or tips down in the comments. That'd be awesome for the question of the day because um, I'm learning, even though I've been doing this a little while, like just even processing Killian's effort and Sage and, and Joe and everybody, all the other guys out there, like I'm learning, like I don't know, I feel like I'm a little bit of a rookie in this mountain running world uh, as far as at this type of level. So bottom line, thank you again. And that's it. Okay. Going to give a shout out to two, not two videos, but two playlists. I'm a, the one on the right is the Solomon running shoe playlist. And the one on the left is the running race playlist. So if you want to dive into Solomon shoes or running races, click on either one of those. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Seek beauty, work hard and love each other. Woo. Great day. See you tomorrow.